The Minding Your Business podcast comes to you once again for episode one on one. Brought to you by the Binge Podcast Network. The Binge! Yes, on a binge.com. We're back yet again on Friday, July the 19th. I'm your host, Champ Ron. This is the Minding Your Business podcast. Thank you so much for your support on episode number 100. It was just phenomenal to have all the support. Thank you to my brother, Cleo, uh, for the shirts. My brother, Dominic Lawson, for all of his support. Uh, with the Binge Podcast Network, his support of all episodes and episode number 100, man, it's just phenomenal. Make sure you're checking out all the great content on onabinge.com and with the Binge Podcast Network. Make sure you're checking out the Startup Life Podcast, Nothing But Buckets, Let's Be Real. Uh, go all the way down the, the lineup that you can check out um, all the great content, exclusive and public. Uh, that's available on the binge. And if you're interested in connecting with the binge, you're interested in advertising, you're interested in just connecting with great podcasters, make sure that you go to onabinge.com, fill out the contact form, and a representative will get back with you uh, fairly quickly. Make sure you go to the mybpodcast.com. That's where you can get uh, exclusive content from this particular podcast. Connect with me, uh, email me, ron at the mybpodcast.com. And check me out at Champ Ron on social media. Today's episode, uh, we're going to have a great guest. And I'm going to get to uh, a face-off with the Face app. But first, what we do? What we do here is go back, 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 back. Yes, welcome to the Minding Your Business podcast. Again, I'm your host, Champ Ron. So glad that you could join me here Friday, July the 19th. It's been a weird weather week. Uh, shout out to everybody in the New Orleans, Louisiana area with, uh, uh, I guess it was Tropical Storm Barry came through. We really just dumped rain everywhere, but, uh, you know, what else is new? Um, today's podcast, I've got a great guest that's going to join me today. Um, his name is Shane Connor. He is the founder and principal of Red Rock Capital Group. And we're so glad, NYB, that he took time to join us uh, all the way from uh, Southern California. And uh, someone that I've been able to check out and, and has a really great platform that he's built. And uh, he's going to share with us today a lot of his background and uh, about the company and, and how you get into business even when you're transitioning from you know, full-time employment like many of you are, uh, Shane's going to help kind of connect the dots with how he's done it and, and kind of you know share with you some best practices on some things that you can take away. And you know that's how we do MYB, so I want you to pay attention, take notes. But uh, Shane, are you there? I'm here, Ron. All right, awesome. Awesome, man. Well, we're here. NYB is fired up. They're engaged, man. They're, they're happy to hear from you. We're getting thumbs up all over the place. So, man, let's do it. I love it. Yep. Friday afternoon, let's go. <laughs> there you go, man. I love the energy. So, hey, Shane, so let, let's get right into this. Um, tell us about, you know, who is Shane Connor? You know, how did you get to where you are today? So run us, you know, kind of run us the story. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Um, I have a background in finance, uh, which I studied my undergrad. Started my career uh, in private equity right in the around the financial crisis so came out um, probably about the worst year to ever come out as a finance professional um, oh. spent a little time in in PE then worked for my father's small business where I really learned kind of you know hardcore sales and road warrior business development then I transitioned into the healthcare um, workforce and staffing business uh, where I spent um, about the last eight years um, building out uh, national fortune 50 programs and launching a couple of P&Ls uh, for that organization and that's ultimately how I got into uh, the real estate investing business. So today I spend my time across uh, three or four different areas, but one of the, the main areas is, is real estate investing. And uh, I was working as a, a commissioned ind individual producer, so there was no uh, limit to your income. And I uh, was having um, what they call a, a few fantastic years. Accounts were popping, commission checks were rolling in, and 
Um, I was looking for somewhere to invest outside of the traditional stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And uh, I landed into the world of real estate syndication, and I really have never looked back. Oh, wow. And so let's kind of unpack that a little bit, Shane. So you get into the business at probably a really tough time. So I imagine this is 07, 08-ish? Yeah, I graduated. uh, Undergrad was 09, so collapse was, you know, thick of 08. And yeah, I was a finance uh, major coming out of college. Gotcha, gotcha. So you come out of school and boom, the, you know, the real world hits you, and it hits you in the mouth like it did many people. Um, now I was already, I was a little ahead of you. I came out of college in '03 when things were kind of booming. You know, we were still reeling from September 11th, but the economy was starting to kind of rebound and and that sort of thing. And like you mentioned, you know, that 08 to 10 area was kind of brutal. So, you know, you get into the business, but you said you found success kind of early on. Yeah. So, um, you know, I I was fortunate that I had had an internship at a a large investment firm uh, in my junior year. And then so senior year coming out, um, I was able to lean on some of those relationships. And, uh, you know, although I didn't totally love what I was doing at the time, um, I was fortunate because, uh, you know, fast forward to about 10 years in the future, what I'm doing now, uh, largely around, you know, private equity and, and large uh, limited partner placements, uh, a lot of that foundation and, and education of how that space and world works, I learned my first year out of college um, working for a very large uh, fund administration house. So um, I was able, you know, I was fortunate to, to be in the spot where I was, although I didn't love what I was doing. So I think it's important a lesson that people can kind of draw on is that even if you don't love your job or exactly what you're doing, try to focus on the positives um, that you can absorb out of that, that you never know where you'll you're, you'll be able to redeploy down the line. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, definitely great, uh, great point there, Shane. And so as you're going through this, what leads you to, to Red Rock? You know, so you're having this yeah. success, so, you, you make yeah, a little so, money. And so how do you get there? So fast forward to, you know, uh, around 2015, uh, 16, I had now been in the healthcare uh, recruiting business for about five years. And, um, you know, a lot of my large scale uh, Fortune 500 accounts had really started to to mature. And uh, so I kind of, you know, really hit the top of the commission scale within the organization. And then my accounts were really, you know, their business was really taken off. So um the, the income was really spiking and I was maxing out the 401k. I was sending, you know, $1,000 a month into the stock market. And, uh, I was still fortunately left over with, you know, a lot of disposable income and, and I wanted to invest it somewhere. So through a lot of research and investigation, I ended up um, becoming a limited partner in a large apartment investment project in Dallas. And, um, you know, from there, I kind of uncovered this whole world that really is a result of the Jobs Act. Uh, in 2012, part of the uh, Obama administration, which kind of allowed for crowdfunding of equity to take place uh, over the internet. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm a benefactor of that. One of the first commercial properties I bought here in Memphis was actually through crowdfunding uh, right. source where I actually, so no matter, yep. yeah, I, I purchased a property um, right. with a significant down payment. And I, and I, you know, again, being a, a finance guy by background, I consider myself fairly knowledgeable knowledgeable about uh, the investment world and I had no idea that this existed right so it was kind of a, an eye-opener to me and then once I dove in uh, dove into the world started to make some some relationships which I was able to then turn to partnerships and that's when I launched Red Rock um, you know it, it just is a, a fantastic opportunity and world that many people don't know about and that's where I enjoy my time now is really educating um, investors, business owners, high net worth individuals, uh, salespeople, the whole gamut, uh, that they can access these opportunities. They just don't know about it. Yeah, absolutely. So talk to us about, you know, limited partnerships. You know, so, uh, you know, it, with your particular target market, Shane, you know, how are they getting invo- involved and, and how do you describe a, a limited partnership for, you know, let's just say you're talking to a doctor or an attorney or, you know, some other working professional or business owner who may not be familiar with the terms and they hear that and they're thinking, oh, well, do I just go and buy a property and get a loan and, you know, like everybody else does or, you know, how does this work? Yeah. So the great thing about, you know, LPs, limited partnerships, I mean, um, they can go, they, a lot of people think traditional private equity um, when they're making really fun to fund placements uh, as a large LP, but it can scale all the way down through the individual investor. So 
in the syndication world, uh, really it's the bringing together of the general partners, the ones who are out there, um, you know, finding deals, putting large assets under contract, sending, syndicating the equity, bringing the equity together. Uh, and that's really where the limited partners come in. It's, it's investors putting their capital in. Uh, and for that, they become a limited partner in these projects, uh, these newly formed partnerships. And for that, they get the benefit uh, of really all of the ownership uh, benefits. So appreciation, cash flow, um, depreciation, and tax benefits. But there's really no um, downside risk outside of, of course, initial capital. There's always sure. risk in investing. Uh, but they're not liable on the mortgage. They're not liable for um litigation that might happen you know on the asset or the property itself so it's a great way for in either individuals or firms um, to partner with experts and basically uh, participate in the cash flow and then the ultimate uh, equity profits when we dispose of the assets without really having to do any of the work Sure, absolutely. And I, I've actually been a part of one of those myself, uh, Shane, and had a great experience and actually you know, made pretty good money, too, um, yeah. which was uh, yeah, definitely exciting. And so what type of projects are um, you typically finding that you're getting partners involved in? Is it, um, you know, it, so, you know just you, so is it all very really, uh, a range? A lot of what we focus on is in the uh, B2B plus uh, multifamily apartment space you know, 100 to 300 unit unit assets. So, you know, larger facilities um, that have some type of, some type of um, value add component where we can come in and in essence, add value, force appreciation, whether that's renovation, uh, repositioning, rebranding, usually a combination of all those. Um, and there's usually three to five year holds on those assets. So, um, you know, we, we bring in limited partners, their capital helps with uh, the down payment, the actual acquiring of the asset, and then the capital expenditures, whatever business plan we're going to do, executing on that plan. As a result, we raise the income level at that asset, which forces a much larger value on it overall, which allows us to sell at a steep profit, again, three to five years down the line. You know, we also partner with a couple um, you know, high uh, institutional grade type operators that uh, do more of a fund structure. So sometimes investors like to spread their risk over multiple assets. Uh, some of the private equity firms prefer, prefer some of these larger scale, um, you know, 30 or $50 million total funds where they can come in as just a piece of it. So those will kind of usually uh, be the same, some type of mom and pop aggregate. You know, we're going to roll up smaller assets and reposition them to sell to um, the larger operators or there's some type of uh, still a value add component, but this way your investment can get spread across maybe 10 or 15 properties over uh, a longer time horizon. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's definitely, I've got my gears turning. It looks like I got some other gears uh, turning too. Um, uh, shout out to all of you on Spreaker.com that are listening to the podcast. And so, you know, so Shane, you know, how do how do you find these projects? Are these referred to you? Are you kind of uh, out searching through a database, or is it just relationships? Or how are you uncovering these opportunities? Yeah, so that's that's where really uh, the value of partnerships uh, come into play, right? And so, yeah. kind of rewind back to when I first started um, as a limited partner investor, I was working you know full time job and just investing on the side, and I got in as an LP. Um, you know, there's, there's a sponsorship and an operator team that's running that deal. And ultimately where I've gotten today is I hold partnerships um, with about five to seven of these key um, operating teams um, and sponsors who are putting together the overall project. And I sit on those general partnerships, but just downstream. After the projects are pretty much ready to go, the deal's in line, and we understand about how much equity we need to raise from investors. Um, that's really where I sit on the general partnership. So... I kind of am a hybrid between, you know, the traditional LP uh, and sitting on the active side where I focus on the investor education and equity piece of the general partnership. So I don't actually have to find these deals. I rely on the experts out there who are doing that. And then once I know a project meets my investor's criteria and really my criteria, I'll choose to participate on the general partnership. And then I go out through my investor networks and bring in um, equity either 
either through an entity, uh, a firm, or the individual investor. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, it definitely makes sense. And so, um, a- as you're working with individuals and you're you're bringing them to a partnership, you know, how how does that typically work with those that are getting involved? Is there a do they come to you and say, hey, you know, Shane, I've got you know fifty thousand dollars cash that I'd like to invest. You know, is it kind of that simple or are you kind of having more of a consultative, you know, conversation with people to, to kind of uncover, hey, what's your risk tolerance and yep. you know, what are you interested yeah, in, so that sort of thing? So it's definitely the latter. Um, you know, the, these are all um, SEC, you know, regulation of 506. Uh, and then there's a few different categories of uh, either accredited um, where you can generally solicit. That's 506C. 5 or 6B, you can have some sophisticated investors in there. But the point is, you need a, most of the time, you, you need an established relationship uh, with your investors. And that's why I'm always uh, out there talking and, and having coffee meetings and uh, phone conversations and in-person meetings with potential investors, just educating them on what this space is, right? How does it work? Going over what a typical deal looks like. So I always encourage, um, you know, listeners or potential investors to really get educated before they're even ready to invest. So you can start to develop that relationship, um, you know, with somebody like myself, could be elsewhere. Uh, so that when the time is ready, when you have that $50,000, then you're really just getting to know that particular deal. What's sure. the criteria? You know, what's the market? But your relationship is already established. Somebody like myself, I already know your investor profile, so I know what deal to put in front of you based on our, our previous conversations and my notes that I have for you uh, really on my files. So, yeah, it's, it's really a consultative. I need to understand where you are in life. What's your end objective? Is it, um, you know, are you trying to put kids through college? Are you trying to just use some of your self-directed retirement account to diversify? Um are you a long horizon? Or are you a short horizon? Those are all things that we like to understand um, from the initial meeting. And then I can really um, get a better fit of what projects to put in front of you. Yep. Excellent. And I want to put a pin because you mentioned a little bit earlier, Shane, about, you know, you started the company while you were still working full time. And I know that uh, strikes a chord with a lot of the listeners because there are a lot of people that are kind of in the midst of, you know, they, they have their own thing. They started. Um, they're probably still working you know, full time jobs while they're doing that. So, you know, kind of walk us through that process, because I think it's very intriguing uh, for many people uh, as they look to possibly transition uh, into their own thing, and can you speak to just the the process and maybe some obstacles that you faced, or maybe some advantages that you had uh, by doing so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so the definitely the, the the time constraint is tough uh, when you're trying to juggle both. I mean, I was you know at a minimum usually fifty plus hours a week in in, in the, um, the workforce job, full time job that I was working. Um, so it was a lot of late night phone calls, um, really er- early morning activity, um, working heavy on the weekends, you know, talking to investors, uh, when I was forging my partnerships with all, a lot of the operators. Uh, so time constraints were tough, but that's where balance and scheduling comes in. And there's a good book called 168 hours, um, that your listeners might want to check out. And it just kind of walks through how we have 168 hours in each week and how we have a lot more time than we think, but you have to really um, be strategic and prioritizing um, how you're spending your, your hours. And if you don't plan, you'll usually waste them. So that was a good resource for me. Um, one of the advantages I think that you can have um, is look at your current job and look at any ways that that could actually be synergistic to the side business or the, or the thing that you're building. You know, for me, uh, I was in the healthcare business, so I was partnering and a lot of my clients were physicians. Um, and so, you know, it might just be uh, a natural segue that, you know, at the end of a conversation, you might just mention, hey, I do a lot of real estate investing. If you ever want to check that out, uh, let's set up a call, you know, after hours or on the weekends. And so I was able to kind of nurture a few relationships that way that uh, ultimately once I, you know, exited the industry and, and went full time, I could circle back to some of those people and, and they've actually become investors. Yeah, and that's yeah, you know, it's very interesting because you and I mirror efforts in, in that regard, Shane. Because you know, for me, from a banking standpoint, that's really how I got started in moving. And you know, when my hand was forced um, last year in terms of transitioning from a job, I at least had some kind of base 
uh, to basically start with. And so that came from just having, like you say, those conversations. We were, I was talking with bankers about, you know, what I was talking about from a full time job standpoint. And it says, hey, by the way, um, I also do this. They're like, oh, really? You know, and so they kept that, you know, you have the contact. And so when I transitioned, it was an easy call to say, hey, I'm, I'm in transition and I'm looking to start this up. You know, what do you think and what are, you, what are some thoughts? And they say, hey, we, I'd love to have you do this or, hey, I think that's great. Why don't you try this? And so I got great feedback and yeah, because, great support. Listen, no matter what job you're in, you know, your, your clients, your customers, your uh, coworkers and colleagues, um, you know, they're all just people just like you and, and right. you have a relationship in some form with them and um that that you can carry with you you know indefinitely so you never want to just put yourself in a box say well it's just my job and you know i'm building this thing over here or i don't like my job or whatever it is you usually have to just open your eyes and look at well what are the pros about all this um and that's one of the ways i was able to really make use of uh the time yeah, and so is that kind of where you think kind of having a good, strong base and foundation comes from, Shane, uh, when you're looking yeah. to make that transition? Yeah, I think anybody that's, you know, ultimately looking to, to write to, to maybe go uh, into entrepreneurship or taking a side business and, and trying to make it a full-time effort, you know, you really have to look ahead um, and really try to lay, you know, those good uh, building blocks so that, when you do decide to to kind of make a transition, there's never going to be a great the right time, right? It, there'll always be a reason you can talk yourself out of it. But right. <laughs> if you've at least taken the time to whether it's you know uh, build partnerships that uh, your business is going to lean on and, and need to execute, or it's going to be um, you know clients that you've already kind of got proof of concept with, and that you know are going to be willing to buy your product or service, you need to start. And forecasting laying that out and not just waking up one day going oh I'm going to go do this and now I'm going to leave my job right so you know it's never going to be perfect but if you can at least have uh, somewhat of a parachute before you jump off the cliff um, it's going to serve you well because even the best laid plans are not going to go according to plan <laughs> you're right. things will always take longer <laughs> you're going to have that right. moment two or three months out and going what the heck did I do uh, I need to go back right. so if you don't at least have a lot of your foundation built uh, it's going to be a very very rocky road yep definitely and and when you speak on that shane do you uh, do you recommend people have sort of a nest egg i know you know people come you know have different backgrounds so you know some people have family they got young children some people are single some people are maybe taking care of a, a senior family member you know what would you so what would you recommend for someone that's looking you know down the line and planning you know how should they set themselves up you know maybe financially uh, to make sure not so much comfort but they at least yeah. can you know eat and have lights Absolutely. on and have a roof yeah. over their head i think there's a lot of things you need to do you know you need a you need to be able to uh build you know look at your lifestyle and, and and probably make some pretty drastic changes or cuts or sacrifices in certain areas that you were used to i mean i for years um i was in a highly commissioned job where checks were rolling in and now i'm i haven't had a I haven't cashed a check in three months. So, um, you know, I think each person before they take that transition needs to really um, understand what their debt looks like. If they, you know, if they have any at all, or, or um, maybe get that taken and taken care of before they make the jump. Um, look at what type of cash flowing investments they do have, uh, whether it's all just in the stock market. In my case, I had done um, a minimum of three limited partnerships that pay me cash on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, I had really maxed out a lot of the retirement accounts um, that I was fortunate to have uh, disposable income to put into over my career. So you got to really, you know, give yourself a pretty large runway before you're going to count on any of that income coming in. Sure. And just be able to make sure that um, you can stay, still pay your bills um, while you're in that transition period. Because, it, again, no plan goes according to plan. Things are going to take longer. So if you think, well, okay, I'll just make the jump and uh, I'll start making money in, in month one, well, that might turn into month five. And right. What does that look like for you? You know, what What if month five then turns into month seven? You know, can you can you sustain that? And how much are you dipping into if you are dipping into to savings? And so I think the journey is a lot tougher and different to people. Um, you know, even when you draw it up in your head, um, 
once you're in the thick of it, um, it it's pretty tough. So you want to make sure that you've thought about all those different scenarios. Yeah, definitely. And and our guest today is Shane Connor, uh, MYB, with Red Rock Capital Group, uh, sharing some great uh, nuggets and uh, great best practices here. And so, you know, Shane, as as we kind of get to wrapping it up, and uh, definitely appreciate your time on this. This has been phenomenal. Um, just the uh, the the insight and the yeah the the information that you're sharing. You know, what are two or three best practices that just in general? Uh, you'd like to leave with the MYB community on, you know, if they're looking to invest, maybe, you know, they got 401k money or they, they've got money sitting in savings or maybe they've inherited something and they just don't know what they want to do. Um, or they're looking to, you know, again, start that business, like you said, and they're, they're trying to determine what, what's that, what's that look like for me? Um, yep. you know, what, what are some things that you'd share with those folks? Yeah, so um, I'll share a couple things. One, uh, I'd say a best practice, I think, just that can be utilized across the board that I have found helpful um, is really what I call kind of staying in your lane. Um, it, I think it's really easy to get into the comparison, like, you know, look, what, look at what that guy's doing or I'm not progressing as fast as they are. Um, there's always going to be another level. Um, right. And the analogy I like to use is like in Fort Lauderdale, you think you have a, a big boat until the mega yacht turns the corner. <laughs> yeah. So there's always going to be somebody <laughs> right. uh, at a different level. Um, you just got to stay on your journey and, and stay on your path. Um, two would be, you know, you should always be playing the long game. Um, you can't really rush success. You can't really rush um, milestones. And, and you won't, you'll have days where you don't think anything's happening. But it's it's the under the surface progress that's culminating that one day six months from now something's going to happen a success and it'll be hard to draw a straight line to it but it's that six months before of daily pushing that led to that moment being able to take place so just not getting too caught up in the day to day just keep keep steady and know that it's a long term play that you're after and, and those little successes will start to to add up for you um in terms of you know investing you know uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can get involved um you know uh, you you mentioned retirement accounts um that's a great vehicle that uh, a lot of our investors use is is people don't realize that if they have self-directed iras or self-directed um you know uh, other retirement accounts they can actually allocate you know a portion of that capital to a lot of different things including real estate projects um, and it's really a good transition because that's a long-term bucket anyway, right? You're not planning on tapping that for, you know, probably in most cases 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, a lot of these syndication projects are, uh, you know, they're five-year buy and holds where, you know, we're acquiring an asset, and we're really going to renovate and reposition over two or three years, maybe refinance, continue to stabilize and sell. So, um, if you've got a big bucket of money that's just kind of sitting there invested anyway, you know, you can apportion some of that into these projects to give yourself some, some diversification uh, and some exposure to real estate. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, matter of fact, I've done some of that, too, in my career where I've allocated buckets to real estate. I've just been, you know, real estate background. I mean, I, I uh, buy on terms now um, and I work with uh, distressed sellers. Uh, mostly here in this Memphis market, and I also help tenant buyers uh, be able to buy without uh, having to get the mortgage first. And so, yeah. Um, so yeah, you're exactly right. There's a, a slew of different ways to to get involved, and and those are some great best practices, uh, most definitely, Shane. And so, um, for people that are interested, how can they get in touch with you? If you know, someone's hearing this and they're saying, "Hey, I love to connect with Shane," you know, how can they do so? Great. Yeah, I'm always uh, always happy to talk uh, day in and day out. They can email me at uh, Shane, S-H-A-N-E, at Red Rock Capital Group, uh, dot com. They can go to my website, which is just Red Rock Capital Group dot com. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, you'll find me there most days. So just, you know, shoot me a message or a, uh, a connection. And uh, I'm always happy to help, you know, even if it's just a uh, 20, 30 minute phone call to, to get acquainted. Yep, absolutely. And there it is. So, NYB, I, I encourage you, you know, if you're serious now, 
um, reach out to Shane uh, email or LinkedIn and uh, he's happy to answer your questions and uh, that sort of thing and help you to get involved so listen Shane I know you're a busy guy um, you're doing a lot of great things and, and helping a lot of people man so thank you so much for joining here on the Minding Your Business podcast uh, I'd love to remain connected with you and uh, hopefully uh, maybe there's an opportunity for us to do some business here uh, short or long term but I wish your business the very best I uh, wish you the best person and professionally and thank you again yeah, it's been a pleasure Ron thanks for having me alright thanks Shane later all right. on alright bye bye all right, so that was Shane Connor with Red Rock Capital Group joining here on the Mind of Your Business podcast, y'all. And like I said, you got some great nuggets. And, and he said something that um, was really important, which was um, you got to make sure that you stay in your lane. In our social media world that we live in, it's easy to get sidetracked with seeing what everybody else is doing and, and comparing and contrasting yourself to that. And I would advise you, um, we're all guilty of that. I'm certainly guilty of it, but I'd advise you to not do that. Do not get into the rat race rut of seeing somebody's post or seeing other people's post or seeing groups and things like that and start comparing and contrasting yourself. Well, why ain't I doing that? And why not, why not this? And why that? And don't get into that. And beating yourself up over your time frame. Well, they're doing this and they're younger than I am and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everything, everybody's got their own path. And you heard Shane say that. Everybody's got their own kind of pathway uh, to their own righteousness and their own um, journey to their destination. And so don't compare. So don't, you know, don't start comparing your boat to everybody else's yacht. Um, You don't know how they got their yacht. You don't know what they went through to get it whether that was good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so it, it's really some good best practices that he shared. And definitely connect with Shane. Uh, that's Shane, S-H-A-N-E, at redrockcapitalgroup.com, or you can visit redrockcapitalgroup.com. Let's get into Ron's rundown. Okay, so today on Ron's Rundown for the July 19th, 2019 edition of Ron's Rundown, let's take the face off of FaceApp for a second. So this week, uh, we were speaking about social media, by the way. On this week, um, the Face app, which is on Apple, it's on Google, wherever else that you find uh, your apps, Face app came out in 2017. So it's been out for a couple years, but they made an update this week and it went viral um, because people were wanting to do one of two things. They were either taking existing pictures and making them look older so that to be able to see themselves uh, years older. Yeah, for some folks, that was 20 years. For some people, that was 120 years. But whatever it was, it made them look older or to make themselves look younger than what they are. And many of us, myself included, participated. Many celebrities did. And so as a result of that, it went viral, which is a very interesting kind of piece considering um, our views on privacy. All right. Let me let me share with you something that uh, comes from the privacy policy of FaceApp. FaceApp asked for, and I quote, irrevocable, non-inclusive, royalty-free, worldwide, fully paid, transferable sub-license for the pictures of your face. I'm going to read that again. Quote, Face App's privacy policy asks the user, you and I, for irrevocable, non-inclusive, royalty-free, worldwide, fully paid, transferable, sub-licensable license for the pictures of our faces. Despite them not selling or sharing user data with third parties, um, it was found by the Washington Post this week that their third-party trackers for Facebook and AdMob embedded into the FaceApp. 
Here's the deal real quick. Before I go on, here's the deal real quick, because people were getting all up in arms after everybody participated in the face app. I guess they didn't like the way their face looked on the face app, so they got upset and hot. Here's the thing, folks. I'm recording this podcast using the Internet. We've had the Internet now, uh, as far from a commercial standpoint with people, you know, since, you know, let's just call it the mid 90s. There's been talk about the app being owned by Russia and and there are people that are concerned about the Russians having their face. Let me share something with you all. The Russians been had your face. (laughs) If you were, you you got people getting upset they were born in 1985. Hell, the Russians have had your face your whole life. They had your face before you did. And it's not just the Russians. There's many other countries. Data selling, data brokering, is a big thing now. Every time you download one of these apps onto your uh, iPhone or your Google phone, your BlackBerry, whatever it is that you have, there's a privacy policy. Most of them require access to your GPS, your, your location, access to other apps, access to information on your phone, access to your contacts in your phone. So not only are you sharing your information, You're sharing everybody else's too. All right. Just about every country in the world has some kind of data brokering um, platform or businesses, people involved in it. So information has been going out for a long time. If you've been around, I mean, if you've been around since the 50s and 60s, the United States government, which is one of the largest housers of data, a couple of years ago, we had the breach with Equifax of course y'all didn't get upset with that y'all weren't worried about them having you know your your credit score but and your information from your credit report Equifax TransUnion and Experian have more data than anybody more data than anybody y'all wasn't mad about that only bankers and and those kind of folks were all upset about the Equifax thing that was a, a fart in the wind for everybody else but what's coming along now is that we care about privacy, we being um, the people of the planet Earth, <laughs> and particularly Americans, but we just don't know anything about it. We just don't, we don't know what it means. We don't quite understand privacy and our digital privacy. And so people got up in arms, but listen, folks, they've had your information for a long time. They know what you look like. Um... At this point in 2019, if the Russians wanted to get your picture, they would already have it. You post to Facebook every day. It's Facebook stories, Instagram, post. Some of y'all are on social media all day long. You're on final written warning at your job because you sit there on Facebook all day long. Especially you folks that are in your 30s and 40s. And even early 50s. All right? So relax. They've had the information. Now, part of that, you know, whole deal of, you know, overreacting is um, Chuck Schumer, I believe, was one of the folks who um, he's a Democrat in New York. He's a Senate minority leader, Chuck Schumer, by the way. Uh, He called for a federal investigation in the face app. And he said that the Russian uh, mobile app, quote, could pose national security and privacy risks for millions of U.S. citizens. And Chuck probably doesn't know anything about FaceApp other than what somebody put in his ear. Someone after he probably uh, posted his picture and made himself look a thousand years old, too. (laughs) You know what I mean? So, you know, there's going to be some overreaction to it, but. You know, he, he, you know, here's the thing. Again, information has been out there for a long time when you start talking about social media and all that type of thing. You know, coming out of the election, it was alleged that uh, Cambridge Analytica, um, Steve Bannon, the Mercer family, Facebook, and there was some psychographic profiling that all was involved in the 2016 presidential election that resulted in the election of current president Donald John Trump, the 45th president of the United States. All right. 
So there are people still up in arms and there's accusations and things like that that are still going on. Um, But here's the thing, MYB. Uh, At the end of the day, and many of us use social media and we use these apps and things like that for our business. They're all tracking us. All right. We're always being tracked. And this is the world that we live in. And and it brings up a point of um, at what point do our values that are tied to conveniences, at what point do we manage that with our privacy? And do we still care? Or, Or is it only just about when something like this goes viral and a few articles come out and then people read them and they take them and run with them, not knowing that they posted 12 times to Facebook today. <laughs> so that information has been going out for years. Ad companies, other countries, you know, real estate. We were talking, Shane and I were talking real estate earlier, right? Um, what people learned over time, particularly with the advent of the Internet, is that real estate is not limited to real property. It's not limited to um, buildings and houses and things like that. Real estate is any space, any space that garners any kind of attention, that garners eyes, that garners attention, because eyes and attention ultimately garner money. All right. That's where data brokering and all that kind of thing comes into play. There are people who want your information and they'll buy it for the right price. And that price is constantly going up. Because having access to people, having attention and for sure, having eyes and ears and hearts is very profitable. So you say, well, Ron, what do we do? That's a great question. <laughs> um, obviously, none of us read the privacy policies on any of this stuff that we're doing. We just accept. Do you accept this uh, policy? We just click yes as fast as we can. Because we don't sit and read all the stuff that these uh, fancy attorneys have dr- written up. Uh, as privacy policies, we should probably all start taking a look at those and seeing exactly what's being shared and what's not. And don't be shy about reaching out to a company to ask them to delete your information, whether it's Facebook or whoever. They will accommodate you. They may not do it in a, a swift manner, but they will accommodate you. Okay? So it's something to make sure that you check out uh, with these apps is the privacy policy. At the end of the day, if it doesn't meet what you want or what you're comfortable with sharing, then you're just got to make a personal decision on whether you're going to use that app or not. And again, it gets back to the connectivity, the prestige or popularity and how all that ties into our level of taste and risk when it comes to our private information. And you got to ask yourself at the end of the day. What is it about your information that you don't want out or that you think will be used in a unrighteous fashion? And that's something that all of us are going to have to ask. And it's sure something that our children are going to face uh, as they come of age here over the next, uh, you know, coming years. So it's a good conversation to have uh, with your teams and your businesses with how information and how apps and things like that are used, you know, and, and you know, your social media platforms and things like that, review those. And you should always be looking and, and having conversations with your marketing teams, whether that's you or whoever is on your team and make sure that you have an understanding of um, what apps are being used and how information is being shared, what information you're receiving and what information is going out. That's just a good best practice for you in your business. Um, But we're all tied to it, um, fortunately and unfortunately, depending on what side of the coin uh, that you're on. But there's no need to be fearful of FaceApp. Um, But what is a concern is um, our tolerance for data privacy. And so make sure that you remember that um, with whatever you do with your face, whether you're on FaceApp or on Facebook or any of the other social media platforms or apps that are all in our app store and load up our phone. All right? So don't be fearful, but be aware and understand what your tolerance is. All right? Listen, it's been a great episode. Thanks again to Shane Connor 
with Red Rock Capital Group out there in California. Make sure you connect with him. Make sure you give us a five-star rating on Apple. I really appreciate that. That helps grow the show. That helps us expand our reach. Thank you for all of you that are listening and sharing and supporting the podcast. Special thanks to everybody who ordered a shirt. Uh, Those will be going out, the 100th episode uh, shirt for the Minding Your Business podcast. And next week, I'm going to be on vacation, taking family vacation uh, on next week. So we'll be off somewhere enjoying a great time. So there won't be an episode on next Friday, but I will be back the following Friday for more of the Minding Your Business podcast. Entrepreneurship, real estate, trending news. There's no business like minding your own. Y'all have a great weekend. It it should be nice weather in most places. Hopefully you're not rained out. Uh, Get outside, enjoy some sun and be great to yourself and be great to your family. This is Champ Ron. Peace. Here is go back, 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 back.